The forest conservation movement uh, as a movement starts in the 1880s, I would say. And uh, that's when you have uh, American Forestry Association. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting some of the names of them, and, and, and their Canadian equivalents are being established. And what's interesting is Canadians are involved with this as early as the Americans are, uh, and that there is a, it's a kind of a joint force. Can, Canadians are going to American meetings and, and becoming officials in American forestry associations. It's a result of the fact that the l l lumber or logs are, are disappearing, right? I mean, the first wave was the square timber industry uh, until the 1840s, let's say, so all those big white pines in the Ottawa Valley and so on are kind of um, cut over. And then you've got a sawmilling industry, which is a result of railway construction, which can support the, the, the square timber was flood of, floated down the river and then loaded onto wooden sh sailing ships and taken to Liverpool in England. When that industry dies out, the sawmill industry replaces it. So you, it's much more decentralized. Lumber is created in the colony, in the province, rather than in England, where it's sawed up. Um, and so that's a huge boost to the uh, lumber economy. It means that uh, smaller trees can be cut and so on. By the 1880s, those trees were beginning to disappear as well, because there's no reforestation, there's no conservation per se. And so the lumber lords, as we call them in the Ottawa Valley in particular, uh, were concerned about this. And um, they start forming these associations to try to uh, preserve lumber. And a lot of it is directed against colonization, which I was talking about earlier. They, they argue that these uh, colonists moving into inferior land are causing forest fires, are there actually false colonists and, you know, in, uh, trespassing on their timber limits, that sort of thing. Um, forest fires are, are big. I mean, it's not just about colonists. They're also arguing that uh, hunters and fishermen are being irresponsible in causing these fires and creating a lot of problems. I wouldn't say um, tree planting hasn't really is not seen as as uh, possible yet. That doesn't happen until the 20th century. So it's more a question of trying to uh, trying to preserve timber and let it uh, regenerate naturally. Um, and Jolie de Laubinière, who I wrote my biography of, is, is a key figure right from the beginning. Uh, partly because his father was from France and they were much more advanced, of course, in forest conservation. Uh, in Europe, having fewer trees than we were in North America. So when he becomes a senior, uh, he begins to introduce, he applies these methods in which he does not, you know, clear cut, as we say nowadays. There's uh, limited cutting uh, each year and um, the, the uh, I suppose, you know, younger trees are left to, to regenerate and, uh, and so on. And, uh, well, he was very much against hemlock, uh, cutting hemlock for creating tannic acid, for example, which devastated large areas, uh, would not allow that to happen on his land. Um, so, yes, I mean, and I think uh, Jolie de Laubinière, when he became Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia in 1900, was influential here as well, because he brings some of those ideas west and, uh, and uh, he is very interested, for example, in uh, preventing the, ex the exporting of raw logs to the United States, which you know, Quebec and Ontario and then later British Columbia introduces, to keep manufacturing within the provinces themselves. So I argue that he influenced Premier McBride, who introduced, you know, who introduced a lot of these measures, and British Columbia profits greatly by the lumber industry as a result of that. Well, partly because the demand was increasing, but also because more jobs were created here. And of course, we've moved away from that in recent years, our exports of raw logs, but in the early 20th century, that was uh, forbidden in most places. I mean, in many ways, it doesn't have that big an impact because, I mean, even when I moved here in the 1970s, it was huge clear cuts taking place, right? So uh, forest conservation is not one of those things that has an overnight success. Um, but it's interesting that the people who are behind forest conservation are not what we would call ecologists today. They were the forest entrepreneurs themselves.
uh, in their own economic self-interest. But some of those guys from the Ottawa Valley move out here and they start the, the lumber industry here, for, for example, in, uh, in uh, Port Coquitlam, uh, uh, Fraser Mills. I mean, that is an Ottawa Valley mill and that is the largest mill in the world for, for some time. And they bring French Canadians in to work those mills from the Ottawa Valley. So that's also, this conservation is one response to forest depletion in the east, but shifting your operation to the west coast is another response.